Good morning. Uh, today we have um, Dr. Uh, um, Leah Bolger, who retired in uh, 2000 from the U.S. Navy at the rank of commander after 20 years of active duty. She currently serves the, as the president of the board of directors of World Beyond War. All right, so this is a big, uh, brief rundown of my 20 years in the military. Um, I had my degree in, in um, fine art, and uh, so I was able to be commissioned as an officer. Um, I had four overseas duty stations, Iceland, Bermuda, Japan, and Tunisia. Um, and I stayed on, uh, I lived on overseas bases, so uh, part of my talk is going to be talking about bases, so I have some experience with that. So World Beyond War, um, this organization was um, created to address the institution of war and not just the war of the day or pushing back against one different kind of uh, weapon system, uh, you know, um, F-35s or drones or whatever. Um, it's, to, it's to address the entire institution of war um, and what supports it and how can we change the the, the global security system that we have now, which is based on war and the threat of war with one that's based on international law and diplomacy and that kind of thing. So um, we call ourselves an anti-war organization and sort of differentiate between being anti-war and being pro-peace because everybody is pro-peace and there are thousands of peace organizations and there are lots of things you can do to promote peace that don't address war at all. So we really want to focus in on war and be anti-war. And uh, some people don't want, want to be anti-something, but I have no problem being anti-war or anti-child abuse or anti-cancer. So I, I view it the same way as being anti-war. Uh, um, and then we've, we've drafted this document, a, a Global Security System Alternative to War. We call it the AGSS uh, to abbreviate it. And this is what we identified as our blueprint for transitioning from one system to the other system. And there are three parts to it. Demilitarizing security is the first part, managing conflict without violence, and building a culture of peace. We also really focus on it being an international movement because we know it's going to take a coordinated international effort around the world to uh, end war. Um, so this, this book is available on our website. Um, there, we also have a study guide, a free study guide to, that will walk you through it and you can have discussion groups. A lot of, uh, a lot of people do use that um, and for their, their group study. It's, it's, it's really good. Um, so uh, there are lots of reasons to abolish war, of course. Uh, it's, it's immoral, it's illegal, ineffective, harms the environment. And it costs too much. And you would think that even if these other reasons didn't resonate with people, I mean, this one should be reason enough, my goodness, but uh, these other reasons don't resonate. Surely this one would. Uh, when you look at the money that's spent in our federal budget, this, this graph shows the difference between mandatory uh, and, and discretionary spending. This large area is mandatory, and that is um, Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, our entitlement programs, as the Republicans like to call them. Um, this is the discretionary uh, fund um, is only 30% of the total, and then this is interest on the debt. So from the discretionary uh, funds are where we get the, the war funding and all that. So I wanted to show you this, this uh, point, though. As you, as you see, military spending, a percent of federal spending on mandatory things is, um, is, is increasing. Let's see. Yes, the percent on mandatory is increasing. The Social Security is costing more as more and more people retire. And our discretionary budget is going down significantly. However, our military budget is going up, 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 up. And that shows you really that where our, our values are, are a little bit misplaced, I think. So here's the mandatory breakdown. And I, as I met, mentioned before, the Social Security, uh, these things are the lion's share of it. Uh, federal spending, and you can see more than half of it goes to the military and war. And in fact, it's actually even more than this because some things, uh, they kind of sneak into the budget. You wouldn't know it, but nuclear weapons all come under energy. 
uh, the, here under the Department of Energy. Um, you don't see that. There's also what they call contingency funds, um, uh, a, a communication satellite stuff will go under a communication. So it's, it's hidden, but it's well over half of our, our, uh, our discretionary budget. So the National Priorities Project is, is a great place to a resource, and it, it will compare what your people in your town spent on war uh, uh, and, and, and what you could have had in, instead. And, and this is, a, they have different trade-offs. You can, you can check on different um, things that are of interest to your community, uh, you know, libraries or firefighters or whatever, how many more you could have. And you would still have a, a $100,000 left over. You could have all these things or you could pay for war. So I think you will all agree with me that the budget is a moral document, just as Martin Luther King described. So um, the, the gist of this uh, presentation is about the American foreign military bases. And the history of the bases uh, was cre were created in the form of forts that sprang up as the US Army, Army cavalry units moved across North America. The philosophy of manifest destiny, a belief in the inherent superiority of white Americans, as well as the conviction that they were destined by God to conquer the territories of North America, was used to justify the fighting killing and displacing thousands of indigenous natives to make way for white settlers moving west. The first of these bases, Fort Harmer, was formed in 1785 and was situated on the Ohio River near what is now the city of Marietta. At its peak, the number of U.S. Army forts totaled 90, and some of these forts are still operating. For example, Fort Meade, located in Maryland, just north of Washington, D.C., was built in 1878 and is currently the home of the Defense Information Systems, the U.S. Cyber Command, the National Security Agency, and the Army Band. The roots of uh, military, our global military presence began in, on September 2nd, 1940, when FDR and Churchill made a private secret agreement for the U.S. to transfer 50 World War I vintage destroyers to England in exchange for 99-year leases to seven British air and naval bases in Newfoundland, Bermuda, the Bahamas, and several small Caribbean islands. The concept of creating and maintaining foreign military bases is something that really only became a thing in the post-World War II era as the defeated nations, Germany, Japan, and Italy, were all forced to accept permanent installations from the United States. World War II had devastated all of Europe, leaving the U.S. a late entrant into the war as the sole remaining superpower. This is important because it meant that the U.S. was one of the few nations that was even capable of setting up such an international system. The Korean and Cold Wars spread up the expansion of military infrastructure to other countries. The U.S. continued to set up posts all over the globe to ensure a geopolitical foothold in every place that they believed to be vulnerable to Soviet influence, which basically meant everywhere. This chart it sometimes is kind of a uh, an awakening for people, uh, civilians who've never seen it before, or didn't realize that the United States government divides the world up into sectors for, for, by which we can command them. And so this is uh, North, the U.S. North Command, South, South America, Europe, uh, AFRICOM, this actually is new. I was stationed in Tunisia. AFRICOM was not in existence. All the African countries fell under UCOM, and those were our bosses. But um, in addition to all the all these command all these comms all these geographic comms we now have a space com that uh, you remember um, President Trump enacted. So we have about two hundred thousand people deployed in these uh, bases, which is amazing to me. I mean, why in the world do we have two thousand troops stationed? I mean, forty five thousand in Germany. Why? Why fifty thousand in Japan? A very small place. Why? Why do we have them? So this, this chart is good to show you um, the, the breadth of the bases. As you will see, the, the yellow circles are uh, where the bases are, and the larger circles indicate more bases. The orange are what we call lily pads, and they are, they're small places. They can be very quickly set up, and they have few, very few personnel set on them, uh, uh, placed on them. They're um, frequently used for drone, um, uh, drone sites, for drones to be stationed there. Um, and they're, they're very 
they're inexpensive to set up and uh, easy uh, quickly to set up. And then there are several unconfirmed ones because the military doesn't always let us know every place they put a base. And you also have to remember that the United States has 11 uh, carriers, aircraft carriers, and each carrier goes with it at probably six or more, even ships, including a submarine and the firepower that's available on an sub- on a, on a aircraft carrier with the aircraft, it's, it's phenomenal. So we have the world surrounded with our military. Here's some examples. The left one is a lily pad and you can see it's, it's not very inviting and this is probably not a very um, requested duty station uh, in Djibouti. Uh, and Ramstein, which is, uh, I think, the biggest uh, military base, we have foreign military base. It's like a small city. It would, they, it, they call them little Americans. Um, Ramstein has about 34,000 people on it. It's much bigger than, than many towns, of course. Now, when you have a big base like that and you're allowed to bring your families with you for your duty station, then you have to have all these amenities. And indeed, they have all these things, swimming pools, golf courses, daycare, all these things are required. And of course, they cost a good bit of money. So here's an example. This is a hospital. Um, the Navy Exchange or Military Exchange, I should say, is, uh, is like a, a Target store. I would, I would equivalent um, at Fitness Center. Um, here's this one that makes me laugh. Um, you, you know, wherever there's Americans, you're going to have fast food. But this one just, uh, this is amazing to me. This is in Afghanistan. And due to the Pakistan border closing, Popeye's has had to temporarily close because they haven't been able to reach their, re, 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 receive their food shipments. And they apologize for the inconvenience to these soldiers stationed in Afghanistan that they can't buy their Popeye's chicken. Just blows me away. All right. So... <clears throat> Um, why does uh, why does the United States want all these spaces? Well, there are are I don't know what's the the theme or the the, the dictate of uh, American foreign policy is called full spectrum dominance, and they mean the full spectrum. And it's the Space Command in, indicates I mean every place: uh, water, air, sea, land, um, and space. Um, we can. We want to fight on someone else's soil. You know, the United States has never uh, had war on United States soil. We, Hawaii was bombed, but we didn't fight on Hawaii soil. So uh, the United States doesn't ever want to do that. Um, it's a good way to preposition weapons and supplies. It makes, uh, it makes fighting the war much easier and uh, expeditious. Um, they also like to... Uh, 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 conduct uh, exercises with a host nation militaries. And, and that sort of entrenches that military to uh, be part of the American military industrial complex, because once they start buying uh, our, our equipment, then of course they have to buy the replacement parts and they have to buy the training for them and all those things. So uh, it's, a, it's a way for the United States to uh, insert themselves into the other country. Why do some countries want them? Well, there are some reasons and there are some countries that do want them and they do provide some jobs um, and they do help some, in some countries, they do help the economy. Um, however, there are downsides to this too. And I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, assets, they build them um, sometimes. Um, they, I think a lot of it is they don't wanna cross the United States. And then foreign aid, this is sort of a misnomer. If you ask the average American, what is foreign aid? Or we give, we give so much, we give $3 billion in foreign aid to Israel, for example. Foreign aid in the vast majority of the cases means military credits for them to buy military uh, equipment from Lockheed and General Dynamics and all those things. So your tax dollars are given to these countries, and then they use them to purchase from our military machine, which makes the, the machine wealthy, keeps it rolling along, and takes your tax dollars to do that. Um, foreign aid, it, uh, oh, here I just mentioned that. So uh, when, I, uh, when I was stationed in Tunisia, I worked at the Office of Defense Cooperation in an embassy. There is no base there, but uh, I worked in the embassy. And there's a handful of, of military people that work in every embassy as attaches. Um, and our job, my, my job was threefold. One part was foreign military sales, and that uh, in, in large part is 
um, given where we give equipment um, to other countries. In the case of Tunisia, it's a very small Navy. We gave them a, a frigate. Uh, and and uh, it, it, I mean, if, it was one that the United States wasn't using. We don't usually give away, we don't give away good equipment. We, we give away old equipment and we, and we give them money to buy the new equipment. That's the way it works. Um, another part of my job was organizing uh, joint military exercises between all of the American uh, military forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, as well as the, uh, the host nation. Um, these things, uh, as I mentioned, are, are always done at the, uh, the, the United States would be leading the exercises, even though they're done in the other country, um, because uh, they, they call the shots as far as strategy and tactics and those kinds of things for the exercises. Foreign military sales, I mentioned that. And the third part was international education and training. Uh, we spend a good minimum of money, uh, we, we in the United States, on um, uh, IMED, it's called International Military Education and Training, where we um, send um, foreign military folks to the United States uh, for training on um, American weapons or um, education about, for instance, um, uh, the United States hold, um, they have classes and like in um, um, civil military separation, uh, democracy building, supposedly, that kind of thing. Um, when I handled the, 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 uh, the, the, the Navy's classes, mostly they were in um, fishing rights and that kind of thing, having to patrol their own, uh, their own waters. So why should we close the base? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, the one I, I think is that they heighten tension. The presence of almost 200,000 US troops, massive arsenals and thousands of aircraft tanks and ships in every corner of the earth present a very real threat to surrounding nations. Their presence is a military reminder, excuse me, is a permanent reminder of the military capacity of the US and are a provocation to other nations. Even worse for heightened tensions, the resources housed on these bases are used for military, quote, exercises, which is essentially war practice. They facilitate war. The prepositioning of weapons, troops, communications equipment, aircraft, fuel, et cetera, make the logistics for U.S. aggression quicker and more efficient. Because the U.S. is continually creating plans for military actions around the world, and because the U.S. military always has some troops on the ready, the initiation of combat operations is very simple. They make more, more likely. Dr. David Vine, a professor of anthropology at American University, the author of Base Nation in the United States of War, says that the presence of the bases make war more likely. Rather than deterring potential adversaries, U.S. bases antagonize other countries into greater military spending and aggression, which creates an arms race. Russia, for example, justifies its interventions in Georgia and Ukraine by pointing to encroaching U.S. bases in Eastern Europe. China feels encircled by the more than 250 U.S. bases in the region, not to mention the aircraft carriers, which has led to a more assertive policy in the South China Sea. They provoke ter terrorism. In the Middle East, in particular, U.S. bases and troops have provoked terrorist threats, radicalization, anti-American propaganda. Bases near Muslim holy sites in Saudi Arabia were a major recruiting tool, tool for al-Qaeda. They endanger host countries. Countries which have U U.S. military assets stationed on them become targets for attacks themselves in, any, uh, in response to any U.S. military aggression. As I mentioned, I don't think we'll be fighting a war on the U.S. soil. If, if a country wants to hurt the United States, they will attack one of our allies, I believe, my personal opinion. They house nuclear weapons. Effective 22 January 2021 this year, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons took effect. Nuclear weapons belonging to the U.S. are positioned in five European countries, Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey, countries which do not have nuclear weapons themselves. The possibility of an accident or becoming a target could be especially catastrophic. World Beyond War is working with activists in Europe to pressure their governments to get the weapons out of their countries. Even more reasons. They support dictators and repressive, undemocratic regimes. Scores of U.S. bases are in more than 40 
author authoritarian and less than democratic countries, including Bahrain, Turkey, Thailand, and remember Dur Turkey, we have nuclear weapons there. Bahrain, Turkey, Thailand, and Niger. These bases are a sign of support for governments implicated in murder, torture, suppressing democratic rights, oppressing women and minorities, and other human rights abuses. Far from spreading democracy, bases ab abroad often block it instead. They cost an exorbitant amount of money. Estimates of the yearly cost of US foreign military bases range from 100 to $250 billion. According to the United Nations, world hunger could, world hunger, this is an incredible statistic to me. According to the UN, world hunger could be ended for the cost of only $3 billion, with a B, dollars, $3 billion. That's 3% of the American military budget. Just can imagine what we could be done with the additional uh, 97 billion uh, uh, <laughs> that would be left over. They deny land to indigenous populations from Panama to Guam, to Puerto Rico, to Okinawa, to dozens of other locations across the world. The military has taken valuable land from local populations, often pushing out indigenous people in the process without their consent and without reparations. For example, between 1967 and 1973, the entire population of the Chagos Islands, about 1,500 people, was forcibly removed from the island of Diego Garcia by the United uh, by uh, the UK, so that it could be leased to the United States for an airbase. The Chagosian people were taken off their island by force and transported in conditions compared to those of slave ships. They were not allowed to take anything with them and their animals were killed before their eyes. The Chagosians have petitioned the British government many times for return of their home and their situation has been addressed by the UN. Despite an overwhelming vote of the UN General Assembly and an advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice in The Hague that the island should be returned to the Chagosians, the UK has refused and the US continues operations from Diego Garcia today. Recently, I read an article uh, on the CNN website, quote, the secret of Diego Garcia military base may be 1000 miles from the nearest continent, but it has all the trappings of a modern American town. The troops here can dine on burgers at Jake's place, enjoy a nine hole golf course, go bowling or sink a cold beer at one of several bars. The local command has nicknamed the base the quote, footprint of freedom. <clears throat> they cause economic problems for host countries, host in quotes. The rise in property taxes and inflation in areas around US bases has been known to push locals out of their homes to seek more affordable areas. I was stationed in Yokosuka, Japan, and there was not enough room on the base for all the military people stationed there in base housing. So they give Americans a stipend to rent places off base. So, uh, so that inflates the, the cost and the local people can't afford to live in their own towns after the Americans uh, you know, inflate the prices. Many of the communities hosting bases overseas never see the economic windfalls that US and local leaders regularly promise. Some areas, especially in poor rural communities, have seen short-term economic booms, booms touched off by base construction. In the long term, however, most bases rarely create sustainable, healthy local economies. Compared with other forms of economic activity, they represent unproductive uses of land, employ relatively few people for the expanses occupied, and contribute little to local economic growth. Research has consist consistently shown that when bases finally close, the economic impact is generally limited and in some cases actually positive. That is, local communities can end up better off when they trade bases for housing, schools, shopping complexes, and other forms of economic development. They station American troops who commit crimes. There's a long history on the Japanese island of Okinawa of the local population suffering violent crime at the hands of American military, including kidnapping, rape, and the murders of women and girls. Additionally, prostitution is perpetuated near, near US bases. And this is a more recent problem. They station American troops who violate local health precautions. Up until July of 2020, COVID had largely spared Okinawa, Okinawa, who were abiding by strict protocols. There had been fewer than 150 infections and only seven deaths among a population of nearly 1.5 million to that point. 
Though an international travel ban was in place, U.S. personnel, military personnel were exempt and incoming Americans brought COVID with them, but the bases weren't kept locked down and cases started showing up in the community. So another case of American exceptionalism with no concern for cultural norms and cultural and uh, international norms. This is a big one, uh, the environmental damage that is caused. Most host country agreements were made in the years before environmental regulations were in place. And even now, the standards and laws that have been created for the U.S. do not apply to U.S. foreign military bases. There are no enforcement mechanisms for host countries to apply to ensure adherence to local environment regulations either. And they may not even be permitted to do inspections due to the status of, form of forces agreements or SOFAs between the countries. Moreover, when a base is returned to the host country, there are no requirements for the U.S. to clean up the damage it has caused or even disclose the presence of certain toxins like Agent Orange or depleted uranium. The cost to clean up just those two things, fuel, fire, uh, just two things, excuse me, not Agent Orange and depleted, the cost to clean up just two things, fuel, firefighting foam, uh, and, and called PFAS, costs billions. Here's an example of the disparity between the funding for cleaning up environmental problems. In 1998, which is the only year I could find money for figures for this, in 1988, over 20 years ago, 2.13 billion was set aside for environmental cleanup on stateside basis. 25 million was set aside for all the foreign bases for cleanup. So it's, there's virtually nothing. Nothing is set aside to clean up the, the problems that we cause environmentally. Other, there are other types of uh, pollution, noise pollution. The exhaust of U.S. planes and vehicles cause significant degradation of air quality. Toxic chemicals from the bases enter the local water sources and jets create enormous noise pollution. This, I've actually seen signs like this on stateside bases too. Pardon our noise, it's the sound of freedom. Ecological damage has been caused by the construction of bases as well. For instance, at Jeju Island, South Korea, an area designated as an absolute conservation area and a UNESCO biosphere conservation area, and despite strong opposition by inhabitants of Jeju Island, a deep water port was constructed for use by the United States, which has destroyed the coral reefs. In Japan and Okinawa, you see here, this is, this is Hokkaido. I, I spent some time uh, stationed there. This is Honshu, the main island. This is um, Shikoku. This is Kyushu. And this tiny red place down here is Okinawa. As I mentioned before, there are a lot of troops stationed in Japan, including 90 military bases. But 60% um, of those 90 bases are in that tiny, tiny island of Japan, which accounts for only 6% of the total landmass of Japan. But they take up 20% of the island of Okinawa. I, let me, I, you know, I go back. Um, I, you may not know the history, but Okinawa, Okinawa is, you probably do, but Okinawa is, was occupied by uh, Japan and, and now the United States. But the Okinawan people, uh, there's a, a separate culture and even separate language that, that long, you know, older uh, Okinawans speak. And, and they've always been treated as like a... Um, uh, uh, I don't want to say redheaded stepchild because that's such a terrible thing to say about redheaded people, but they've been treated like second class citizens, not like American, uh, uh, not, excuse me, not like uh, Japanese uh, citizens on the other islands. Um, and you'll, you'll see uh, the example of that is that uh, they, they are allowing all these military bases to take over the island of Okinawa, even though the, the local people don't want them. So this is air base. Uh, this is a, a, a marine base in Putenma. Uh, it is very, very crowded. As you can see, it's surrounded wall to wall by uh, civilian homes. It was from this base that uh, some Marines were stationed uh, who, who murdered uh, some, some girls uh, some time ago. And after that happened, there was big outrage. They wanted the Marines out of there. And that's when they decided to start building another base to put them on. Uh, in Hanoko, 
And this airbase <laughs> uh, was, uh, it, it, it was to house part of the Marines. Part of them are going to go to Guam, and Guam doesn't want them either, but they're going there t- is anyway. Um, but Jan- uh, Japan agreed to build this base uh, largely at their cost and forcibly began land reclamation in 2018, despite strong opposition by 70% of the citizens. From the beginning, there have been constant protests, originally set to cost 8.5 billion. Now it looks to be uh, at least double that because of engineering problems. And the, the time delay has more than doubled. And this seabed where they have to reclaim, they have to build land, basically. They have to reclaim land to build uh, so that they can put an airstrip on top of water, basically. So not only are they destroying the, 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 the reefs, it, it's, not, um, it's not engineeringly, it's not technically possible to actually do this. Many people do not believe it can actually be done because the seabed is very soft uh, in places. It's called, it's described as like mayonnaise uh, texture. So it's very, very uh, difficult to to create a solid um, surface out of this. Moreover, the the land that they're reclaiming is coming from um, uh, cemeteries and places where uh, people were buried, bones of, of, of uh, J- Japanese citizens, Okinawan citizens, are, are buried there, and they're using that land to, to build this area up. And even more crazy is that this site sits on two fault lines. When I was stationed in, in Japan, we had several earthquakes, not major ones, but they could definitely happen at any time. So it's 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 nuts. Uh, it's just really nuts. This area also, this is a shallow seawater. Is it home to endangered species called the dugong? It's related to um, manatees, uh, which manatees have been endangered in the United States as well. So the construction is destroying their their sea habitat, which is very unique. So there has been resistance around the world to U.S. military bases. And I'm just, there are lots of countries. I'm just going to flip through. There's pictures from several countries, Okinawa, Japan, South Korea, Italy, Germany, Australia, Pakistan, all over the world. So, World Beyond War, uh, when we were created, I, I told you we, were, we, we had the mission of uh, uh, addressing the institution of war. And, but we had to focus our, our work. Um, because where do you start? Where do you start you know, uh, ending war? So we have the blueprint that I mentioned. We also decided to focus our work onto, into three areas. One is the um, education and using the AGSS to educate people about this system and to, uh, to refine it. The other two campaigns that we've decided on, one is the no basis campaign and the other is divestment campaign to urge unions and, and schools and whatever to divest from their, um, their stocks and bonds that are in Raytheon, for example. So the no basis campaign is the one I'm heading up, uh, mainly because I've stationed, been stationed on them, because we feel that, uh, the, the, as I mentioned before, the presence of these bases are threatening and promote war. So if we could just close the bases, we would take a huge step towards uh, you know, toning down the, the tensions and, and making war much less likely. So my vision is that World Beyond War will become kind of the hub for this issue. I don't know of any other uh, anti-war peace organizations that are focusing on closing bases. And so I like World Beyond War to become that that hub, that go-to place. World Beyond War has members in 192 countries. Member is uh, someone who has signed our Declaration of Peace the declaration I'm going to show you here in a second. Um, we can facilitate networking between the other countries and activists because we have a mailing list of over 150,000 people, and we have the people in these 192 countries. We have people in every corner of the world. Uh, we can do the education. We have webinars. We give lots of webinars all the time. I've given this presentation uh, many times. Uh, this one's a little bit tailored for you guys, but um, uh, we can uh, we can su- su- promote to the in-country activists that are already there and, and publicize what they're doing, support them. We can create and organize actions around the world. 
Um, I'm hoping that as a hub, we'll be able to uh, have a massive archive of articles and data. We just recently completed a serious uh, large research project um, uh, documenting the presence of all the bases. And there are what we, what we found are 762 bases in 82 countries. But that changes rapidly. It could be different today because of those lily pads that I mentioned. And you may have heard Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan is closing, but then, you know, two more will or open up somewhere else. So it's very hard to know exactly, but as of uh, last week, that, those were the numbers. So there are other two organizations that World Beyond War is involved with. One is called OBRAC. Uh, it stands for Overseas Based Realignment and Closure Coalition. And um, Dr. David Vine, who I mentioned earlier, the author of these two books, he's the one who put this coalition together. And it's made of... <clears throat> Military analysts, uh, think tank people, uh, a, a former a congressman, uh, prior military people, myself, uh, academics. And we are kind of taking what I call the inside strategy to work with Congress and um, DOD to try to end these bases. And we sent a letter to Trump and, and Mathis, of course, uh, that that's old uh, and it's that's done. And then we, we revised the letter and sent it to the president and um, the secretary of defense this year, again, outlining nine reasons that these bases should be closed. And OBREC has a bit, a good bit of credibility because of the, the, the visibility of the people who are in, in, involved in OBREC. For instance, Andrew Basevich, Colonel Andrew Basevich is one of them. You may have heard of him. He's a, a West Point graduate. He is a um, with the Quincy Institute now, um, he has a lot of name recognition. So we have had uh, articles that cite our, our letter. Um, Newsweek had an article that cited that letter uh, outlining the nine reasons. So this is kind of the inside track. And I, oh, I mentioned BRAC versus OBRAC. The military, DOD has something called a BRAC, Base Realignment and Closure. And this is a survey of stateside bases uh, to, to assess which ones can be closed and combined or whatever. And the, it's very, very, very difficult for the DOD to close a military base, even if they want to, because the Congress people don't want the bases to close because they're in their district. So the DOD can say, I want to close these 20 bases, and Congress will say, no, we're going to keep them open, and we're going to keep putting money in the budget for those bases. So BRAC is, is really hard, to, uh, to for, especially for civilians, to do anything about. But OBRAC is different, and that's why we're focusing on the overseas bases we think it's, it's possible to actually get something done. The outside strategy, I call, um, is the groups like these groups that formed a co another coalition uh, against U.S. foreign military bases. And these groups, uh, you may have heard of some of them or belong to some of them. Um, they don't agree on every issue, but this is one issue they do agree on, of closing these military bases. And so uh, they are more um, likely to, uh, we have organized conferences, we have uh, organized protests, um, that kind of thing. This is what I call the outside strategy is with groups like this. So, um, oh, here, these are examples of things we do in the outside strategy. Sorry. So um, I, um, th the pledge, this is our pledge, our declaration of peace, our pledge. And um, I'll just give you a moment to read it over because I, I really hope that you'll all sign it um, after, you, after you've read it. I'll give you a moment here. How would we, how do we sign the pledge? You, you can go to our website. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Thank goodness you asked, Jill. Um, so here's how you can do all those things. Um, info at World Beyond War. Just go to our website, worldbeyondwar.org, worldbeyondwar.org. And uh, you'll see if you scroll down, you'll see a counter of all the countries that have signed and the counter of, and where you can sign. I'd also like you to uh, consider um, your, your fellowship to sign as an organization. We have over 600 uh, organizations that have signed this pledge as well. Um, I would ask you to consider affiliating. Become, we have um, 85 affiliates, I think, around the world. Uh, we have eight chapters you know, 18 chapters in eight different countries, but affiliates, um, it's, it, there's a, it's definitely kind of a win-win. We, uh, as an affiliate, we, um, you have access to all our resources. We'll promote your events. 
um, and, and connect you with other um, groups that are doing similar work. And, and uh, uh, for us, you know, it just broadens our network and, and, and broadens our work. So if you're interested in affiliation, you can contact us at Info at World Beyond War and talk to our, out, uh, our organizing director, Greta Zaro, uh, and she will explain to you all the benefits and the responsibilities of, affiliation, of affiliating. Um, if you want to get involved with either the Nobasis campaign or a divestment campaign, it may be that the UU Fellowship has invested in some bad companies and you don't even realize it. So you might want to look into that. Uh, we have, we have uh, you know, volunteer jobs for research or uh, planning actions, even simple things like data entry. Um, if you want to get involved, we would love to have you. But at the very least, I hope everybody after this is over will go to worldbeyondwar.org and sign the pledge. And that would, that would make me very happy. And that is all of my presentation. And I'm happy to, um, to um, answer any questions you might have now. Good. Thank you very much. That, that was very interesting. And some questions have come in. And um, first of all, I'm mentioning that um, this was noted that the U.S. spends more on military things than the next 10 company, countries altogether. It's so almost as much as the, the entire rest of the world. Yeah. We um, spend about a trillion and the world spends about two trillion. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and um, that... Two, number two, um, we're thinking of how to get, I think we have to just go to your site, but getting that pamphlet that you said at the beginning and other books that we could have for our library. Mm -hmm. Yes, go to the, the, uh, do the website and, and you, it will, there is a section that talks about the AGSS and how you can order them. And if you want to order them for your, it's not a pamphlet, it's a book. It's, a, it's now in its fifth edition. Um, we do have summary versions of it, though. And we have summary versions that have been translated into, I think, 15 different languages. So it's, it, you, you can look at the summary and see if this is something you want to get interested in. And that the summary version is free. But the, the AGSS GS has is a cost, uh, so we don't lose money on it. One yeah. time you said a study guide, though I remember. There's a, the study guide is free, uh, okay. but it's online. online. Yes, and you and, and and you can you can get the study guide free, but the book itself. Uh, yeah. But you can download the book for free uh, if you want to print it or yourself or whatever. But you want a hard copy, you have to you have to pay for it, and, and you know because the shipping is expensive as well too. Um, but I would just also mention that the study guide. Uh, won an international award, the Global Challenge Award for Peace Education. So it's it's really excellent. Yeah, it really that, is good. That would be really good. We have a peace group, the non-nuclear subgroup. I've tried to get them to come today or to be, you know, to somehow mm -hmm. work. And um, that wasn't successful. I do think it's partly the weather. I, I just think that it's a little bit discombobulated. I right understand. Now. So, but uh, that's maybe our next outreach just to see whether that would um, work or why they're not, why they're not already um, joined up. Do you know what I mean? It seems like well, they'll be naturalized. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I, you know, as far as nuclear weapons, uh, at the beginning, I mentioned that we, we had to focus on specific campaigns and that we're not working against any particular weapon like nuclear weapons. We do support certainly efforts uh, publicizing the the treaty and and uh, you know signing on endorsement letters and whatever, uh, but we're not we don't have a, a campaign strictly on uh, nuclear weapons. We we act as a support for that. So that that may be there are other groups certainly that are much more involved with nuclear weapons than we are. Yeah, and then one specific question for me is that that um, it's Henoko. I think how you pronounce it, H-E-N-O-K-O, -O, that island, uh -huh. where they were doing that horrible redoing a new base on the Manet seafloor. Yeah. It seemed like an extraordinarily stupid project, mm -hmm. but somebody's making a mega bucks. Now, that's where I would go. I would go looking at the person who's making the mega bucks from doing a really stupid and expensive, horrible thing and trying to go after them. So do you know who is doing that well the 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 people who are building it are making money so i mean i don't think you can well, go what, the, what is it the, 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 that guy that you know cheney's um the old cheney uh, 
uh, with Black Hawk. Halliburton, you're talking, uh, yeah, yeah. Are they the one? In other words, who can we? Uh, well, I think this is being paid for in large part by Japan, by the Japanese government. And I would think that they probably have Japanese companies that are that are that are building it. I don't know what companies build they, it. Something's wrong there. Well, no. we, we are, you know, the uh, in fact, right now, um, the governor of Okinawa, his name is Denny Tamaki. He um, ran on a platform of closing uh, of stopping Hanoko from being built. And I told you there was the referendum that 70% of the people who live there want it to be closed. There have been daily protests. There have been hunger strikes. The, the Okinawan people do not want it, but the, but the government is saying yes. And this is how I, I'm explaining how the Okinawan people are treated, like I said, a class citizens. However, Japan, I think Japan, the reason they're continuing to do it, even though the Japanese body at large are getting a little... Um, angry at the money, which has gone way, 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 way up. They don't want that money to be spent. But the the new Japanese president is is sort of on the right uh, right leaning, and and he is doing whatever the United States says, which was what most countries will do, whatever the United States says to do. So you know, it's becoming a, a kind of a you know. I think part of it is an ego thing and the pride. They can't. They've got so much invested in it. They can't admit now that it was a, a an abominable idea, and so they have to just keep pouring money into it. It's kind of the uh, the mindset of uh, Vietnam. We, we know that things aren't going well, but we put this many you know much money and lives into it. We can't quit now. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, but uh, anyway, Demi, Denny Tamaki just wrote a letter to President Biden and, and uh, Vice President Harris asking for this project to be stopped. And I am right now uh, working on a, a support letter uh, that we will be getting various organizations to sign on to to support that letter in that position. We're also working on that inside strategy with Congress trying to get a, a review uh, and get this, this base closed. This is the lowest hanging fruit uh, available. I mean, it, there's so much opposition to this. It doesn't make any sense. It, you know, um, that it, this is a, is a problem. And hopefully we can get it stopped but um but they've already done a good bit of damage so it's it needs to you know it's just it's so a tragedy really yeah well thank you uh leah boulder very much for your talk and your time and all your effort into putting um your uh, uh getting all those slides making those slides from scratch i noticed that you did a lot of the uh, uh, things that unitarians are interested in in the moral badness of some of these and how we're hurting people, it always strikes me as this is almost like what we did to the American Indians, mm -hmm. indigenous people, mm -hmm. and people are all up in arms about that. Oh, so bad, so bad. But then this of doing the same horrible things to people outside our country mm -hmm. seems to be washed under the rug. So um, I think yep. that will be brought, I think for the community here, it's uh, brought it more to the attention so that it can be a point of discussion. So that's mm -hmm. what I think we hope will go on in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, oh, are all of you muted or can you unmute yourselves? Did I did I permanently mute you? And does anybody want to speak? Uh, let's yeah. See. Yeah, I, I have a, a question. Um, people from time to time for many, many years have made your, your points about the overseas bases and are they really necessary? Um, I think I think Walter Mondale may have, um, uh, George McGovern may have, I mean, it goes way, way back. Um, what, what is it within the military and within the Congress that hangs on to this? Is it an ideology? Is it the nexus of ideology plus money? Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, powerful money, um, money to be made, you know, from construction, et cetera, et cetera. What, what do you think is, is, is uh, holding all of this back? <laughs> well, one of the nine reasons that we cited in that letter that Obrecht wrote was that uh, they're not strategically needed in, in many places because this is not my reason because I want them all closed. I don't care about strategy to fight wars, but there are nine reasons. And like I said, this Obrecht group has 
has people from both sides of the aisle in it. So we, that's mm -hmm. why we feel like we can. So that's one of the arguments that they're, they're not really necessary strategically. Um, and so that would be one reason to close the base. But then, um, but on the other hand, I think that that dictum of full spectrum dominance is so ingrained. They, they want, the United States wants to be absolutely everywhere. And uh, I, 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 I just think that's it. That's it. This imperialistic idea that we are in charge. We divide the world up into sectors. This is who controls this one. And we control the, the world. And it's better, to, easier to do that when you're right in place, I guess. I, I, I don't know. I think that's probably... Um, but there are there are some people in the Pentagon, if they have to look at cutting money, and they rarely do, um, they will say, yeah, we could we could close some bases. Um, but I think the the lion's share of people with influence just say, um, no, let's leave them where they are. We, you know, we, we, we need them and use them. I think if we get enough outside pressure, though, international pressure, and that's why Hanako, I think, is, a, is maybe we can get this turned around. There have not been that many cases of success in closing bases. One, another is success, a small success was Vieques in Puerto Rico. You, do you all know that situation in Vieques? Vieques is an island uh, uh, near Puerto Rico. It's part of Puerto Rico. And we, you, we, we, uh, our, our military used to have a, a station there at Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, and this island, Vieques, was used as a bombing range. And uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a, in prime location for bombing ranges as they go because of the depth of the water and this, the geography and the winds and all this stuff. I don't know, but, that, the, but the military loved it. And in fact, other governments loved it. Uh, using it, and they rented it from the United States as bombing range. Well, they, before it was a bombing range, it was uh, sugar growers lived there. They lived there and worked there, and they were very happy there, but we displaced them to make this bombing range. Well, there were still some people, I guess, on the island, and, um, and the, uh, uh, there was a, a mistake an aircraft carrier uh, launched a, a, a plane that dropped a bomb uh, and killed people on the island because they they were off by a hundred miles or something, and so then the public, you know, really really got to say we we got to close this thing down. But they had to do civil disobedience and get arrested and put their their bodies in front of the missiles, and I mean it was a big big deal. And they finally finally returned Vieques to Puerto Rico, and it's now an environmental refuge, but. But um, it's the, 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 you know, the closures are very few and far between. Yeah, yeah. There's another thing. World Beyond War just had our annual conference. And um, so one of the, the speakers, one of the panels was a group of men from Montenegro um, who uh, they have a, a mountainous geography and they have sheep herders and goat herders that live there, been there for, you know, long, 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 long time. And NATO is now wanting to use this as a bombing range. And the people are, uh, they were able to stave off a, an exercise, a war game uh, for last summer, but they're, they're still having to fight to make sure NATO doesn't drop bombs on their on their homes. And so it's going on all the time. NATO has so much power and the United States controls NATO and it's, they're just, and NATO itself is such a provocation to Russia. Uh, you know, when, anyway, I, you, you give me my soapbox and I'll just keep going. But <laughs> well, we think, I think, um, I'm not sure when we're going to be cut off with the time. So let's see if there's any more questions. Are there any more questions? You can unmute yourself for that. And I don't see any. So I thank you again, Leah Bolger, for your very kind time spent with us. And I think you've given us a lot of good ideas. Thank you. Thank you. You're very we'll welcome. You Take care. Go sign the thank pledge. You. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So thank, long. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I'm going to leave now. I'm going to make it go away. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.